So, yes, it's me again. I'm back for another week. Now, first, a disclaimer before we pray, because I need to pray. <laughs> uh, last week's scripture talk was that's the third year I've done that, so I've had some practice at that. This is the first time I've done this because this was Father Taryn Whittington's talk the past few years. And Father Taryn is now at St. Joseph's in Conway. So I, I watched his previous presentations the last two years and I stole things. So I just want to, you know, I'm confessing that out in front of everybody. I mean, who can turn down? Nuggets of wisdom from Father Taryn don't need to be wasted. So we're going we're gonna to use some of that. But before we get started, uh, I want to say a prayer that I, I found this on the USCCB, the United States Congress of Catholic Bishops, on their website. I tried this, I googled a prayer for studying sacred tradition. Eh, goose eggs, nothing. But they kicked me over to the USCCB website and they have a prayer for studying scripture, so I thought I would just kind of use that, so... In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord our God, we bless you. As we come together to ponder the scriptures and tradition, we ask you in your kindness to fill us with the knowledge of your will, so that, pleasing you in all things, we may grow in every good work. We ask this through Christ our Lord, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay. This is a talk about sacred tradition. Tradition. What to start off with? Uh-oh. <laughs> we had this problem last week. No, let's go backwards. There we go. Okay. Can you play it for me? There you go. A fiddler on the roof. Sounds crazy, no? But here, in our little village of Anatevka, you might say every one of us is a fiddler on the roof, trying to scratch out a pleasant, simple tune without breaking his neck. It isn't easy. You may ask, why do we stay up there if it's so dangerous? Well, we stay because Anatevka is our home. And how do we keep our balance? That I can tell you in one word. Tradition! Tradition! Okay, you can stop it now. <laughs> okay, so now that I have your attention and you're awake, I think you're probably awake now. So, um, so you'll notice that the, of course, the title of the talk is Sacred Tradition, but I thought today, maybe another word for what we're about to do is an evening of strange words. Because the church has a lot of ancient words that we still use to describe certain things. And the meanings of those words in 21st century American culture have changed. They don't mean the things that the church uses them for. And we'll, we'll talk about some of those words. And some of them you'll have heard, some of them you won't have heard before. So I'll try to be careful to make sure... I define things so people are kind of, oh, we're all on the same, same track. Does that make sense? Um, okay, the first two strange words are over here. Paradosis, this is Greek for tradition. Traditio is a little more familiar sounding. That's Latin for tradition. The, the Greek paradosis is the word in 2 Thessalonians that Paul uses to talk about tradition. Brothers and sisters, be careful to observe all of the traditions we left you, either by word of mouth or by letter. 
That's the Greek word that Paul uses. So, <clears throat> the reason I bring up the being careful about words is because languages change over time. Not only do words change their meaning, words can change their pronunciation, their spelling, and that can happen in a single language just over the centuries. So right now what I'm speaking you would call modern English. Yes, this is modern English. What? Southern, southern modern English, yes. But it sounds different than the English that the King James Bible was written in. I don't say thee and thou a lot. If I do, well, that'd be weird. But no, you don't use all of those particular types of lingo. But what about English before the English of the King James Bible? The English of the King James Bible is actually pretty much modern English with some differences. The English spoken before King James English was called Middle English. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a phrase in, in Middle English, and I want somebody to guess what I'm saying, where, what it's from. Will not appeal from the surest sota, the droop of March hath pierced to the rota, and bothed every vein in switch liqueur, of which virtu engendered is the fleur. English majors? Anybody? That's the opening lines to the prologue to Chaucer, the Canterbury Tales, in the, in the language he wrote it in. That's Middle English. That's like a step away from what we speak now, sort of. So that didn't sound anything like English. You might have caught April in there there's, and March. The two word, there's two months in there. The rest of it makes hardly any sense. Now, why in the world did I, how, why would I know that? Because my high school English teacher made me memorize the entire thing in Middle English. The whole class had to do that. So, yeah. I love Miss Gates. She was awesome, so I, I can't gripe too much. So, tradition simply means that which is handed down. That almost includes everything. Every piece of knowledge in your head was probably passed down to you by someone else. John Henry Cardinal Newman, a great English theologian from the 19th century, talked about the two different kinds of knowledge. There's real knowledge, and then that's, there's what he called notional knowledge. Real knowledge is stuff that, knowledge that you have gotten yourself. First-hand experience. Nobody told you this. You saw it with your own eyes. Notional knowledge is everything you had to take somebody's word for. Like your parents. How did you find out that this was the Bible, the Word of God? Someone told you. Unless you had a divine revelation on a desert island and, and God told you himself. But most of us, our, our parents told us this is the Bible. That's notional knowledge. The fact that it is the inspired word of God, that's notional knowledge. Somebody told you that. So the amount of, of passing down that goes on is exponentially larger than the real knowledge. And there's like little things that you don't think about. Like how do you know Britain is an island? You don't. Well, I saw it in a map on the book. They could have forged that map. You had to take that map drawer's word. The only person on the planet who knows that Britain is an island is some Navy person from Great Britain has sailed a boat all the way around the island. He can say, yeah, it's an island. I, I sailed all the way around. Or if you're an astronaut, you can look down at it and say, yep, that's an island. Speaking of astronauts, how do you know the, how do you know the world is, the earth is round? Is a sphere. Huh? Columbus told you. Columbus told you, okay. <laughs> well, you, you look at pictures and, you, well, they can forge pictures. You look at a ship going over the horizon and think, well, there's curvature there. That's true, but the earth could be a dome for all we know. So again, that's just a demonstration of what gets passed down. 
All right, so to the subject at hand, I'm going to read a couple of paragraphs from that little book you've got on your, that new book you've got on the table in front of you, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 97 and 98. Sacred tradition and sacred scripture make up a single sacred deposit of the Word of God. It's all the Word of God. In which, as in a mirror, the pilgrim church contemplates God, the source of all her riches. The next paragraph. The church in her doctrine, life, and worship perpetuates and transmits to every generation all that she herself is, all that she believes. So this is knowledge and teaching that the church is passing down from generation to generation. Now a lot of people will say that includes written tradition and oral tradition. Well, oral tradition you might sort of imply that it's not written down. By this time, most of the stuff is written down. You've got, of course, the Bible is the formally written part. And that's easy. You could hold a Bible up and say, well, here's Scripture right here. No problem. Well, show me tradition. Well, the closest thing I can show it is that that book you got, that catechism. That's not the sum total of all tradition. But it's a good place to start. Because... We teach that sacred tradition is it it carries the charism of infallibility. Sacred sacred tradition is protected by the Holy Spirit so that it cannot teach error. Are there possibly mistakes in that catechism? Yes. So the book in total is not infallible, but there are infallible teachings in that book where it talks about the Trinity. That is an infallible teaching. That's part of sacred tradition. Okay. So, so when the new Christians are trying to get organized and do what the Lord told them to do before he ascended, we talked last week about how they didn't, write, they didn't sit down and write a book. Jesus said, after the Holy Spirit comes, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe all I have commanded you. All. Hmm. Well, we got the, we got the scripture part of that, but could there be other things that Jesus commanded them to, to teach? Now, let's see. Did I forget to... Oh, this is, this is the um, Second Thessalonians verse I was talking about. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by letter. Now, we can't really talk about the, the deposit of faith, the knowledge passed down, without talking about the mechanism by which it is passed down. There's, there's two parts of sacred tradition. There's the information, and then there's the mechanism that is entrusted by God to pass the information down. That is the church. And specifically within the church, it's this other big strange word. The magisterium. The teaching magisterium of the church is the vehicle by which sacred tradition is passed down through the generations. The church is given the deposit of faith and it may not change any of the deposit of faith. It's the guardian. It's the mechanism for passing it on. And that's why this verse, I put this up here. I hope to come, this is Paul talking to Timothy. I am writing these instructions to you so that if I am delayed, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and bulwark of truth. So Paul's making quite a claim here. The church holds the truth and is to pass it down.
Notice I said, Jesus said, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. Well, one person might say, well, that's all in the Bible. That's all scripture. That's all you need. You don't need this other stuff y'all are talking about. Well, maybe there are some things Jesus told them that didn't get put down in Scripture. And Scripture kind of attests to that. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that all Jesus is the, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. John threw another doozy in there. This is the disciple who is bearing witness to these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. But there are also many other things which Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that it would be written. So there's other stuff. And that's what fuels part of sacred tradition, is some of that other stuff. So, what about tradition in the New Testament era? Well, remember, all the first Christians were Jews. Jews knew a lot about tradition. They had a lot of tradition. In fact, their Jewish law had 613 traditions, to be exact of all the things they were to do and not to do. Start trying to think of that list, 613 things, and you have to know them all so you don't mess up and break one? And they were, they were, they were big things like keep the Sabbath holy, right? Don't use the name of the Lord in vain. But there were smaller things like When you wake up in the morning and you hang your legs out over the floor off your bed, you are to pick up your right sandal and put it on your right foot. Don't buckle it. Then take your left sandal, put it on your left foot. Don't buckle it. Go back and buckle the right sandal and then buckle the left sandal. I did not make that up. That was in the ceremonial Jewish law that they obeyed. So if you start nitpicking around little bitty things, you can see where you might be able to get to 613 rules. So so the the Jews that became Christians, they're used to the tradition thing. And so, like we talked about, somebody asked a good question last week. They didn't have the Bible, New slash New Testament part of the Bible. They didn't have that yet. That wasn't going to be, they weren't going to start writing that thing for another 20, 25 years. But he told them to get moving. So for the first generation, 25 years of Christianity, it was all oral. They all went out and preached the gospel and made massive amounts of conversions. So... Other things that you you may have heard me say last week, you can't really talk about scripture and tradition like they're completely separate things. They're they're married to each other. They're so intertwined. And I'll give you an example. I don't want to step on Andrew's talk next week. Andrew's going to talk about the church, so I'm not going to try to step on his talk. I'm just going to mention a couple of these things. I wrote up here, Kings, Keys, and B&L. That comes from Matthew 16 where Jesus says, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And I give to you the keys of the kingdom. Now, the keys of the kingdom have a special meaning in Jewish history and culture. That comes from the book of the prophet Isaiah, where he talks about how the, the, the vicar, the king's assistant, his prime minister, carries the keys of the kingdom. That's an authority position. I give to you the power of binding and loosing. What is that? That's another authority position. You can decide what's okay and what's not okay. 
You can bind people's sins to them or you can loose them from them. If you want to know what that means in a Jewish context, there's actually such a thing as the Jewish Encyclopedia Online. It's free. You can go on that website and type in the search bar, Binding and Loosing. There's a whole article about Binding and Loosing. And it basically gives the rabbis the authority to tell people, you know, from what's okay and what's not okay. Now in Matthew, he gives Peter the, the power of binding and loosing. Later on, he gives all, of the, all the apostles the power of binding and loosing. So there's, there's another piece of the, of the tradition that doesn't get explained a lot in Scripture, but the church kind of fleshed that out so people could kind of understand what the apostles were about. They had the power to establish churches and to teach doctrine. So, let's go back and talk about Scripture again. We talked last week about how long it took to get the canon of Scripture. It took till the, pretty much the end of the 4th century. But what was the process that the church went about deciding what books made the 27 in the New Testament, what books didn't? Well, the Holy Spirit helped them first. And then they had four criteria that the, they decided these books have to meet all four of these criteria. If you miss one, you're not going to be in the canonical books. Number one, the writing had to be apostolic. That means written by one of the apostles or a close associate, an eyewitness of one of the apostles. So, St. Matthew and St. John, apostles. Mark and Luke, close associates of the apostles. He hung around with Paul for a while. He went with, with Peter to Rome. Luke was Paul's sidekick in the book of Acts. He wrote Acts, so part of it he was there for. Have you ever read through the book of Acts and noticed that the language changes somewhere in the middle? It stops saying they went here and, we, and they went there or he did this. And, he, and then all of a sudden it's like we went here and we did this. And we, it goes from the, like the third person down. Now he's in the story. That's where, Luke caught up with, that's where Luke joined Paul's missionary journeys. When he starts with the we business, it means he was there. A little piece of Acts trivia. Sorry. So they had to be apostolic. They had to be orthodox. They had to stick to the, to the deposit of faith. The gospel that was preached everywhere, that these books had to be orthodox in their teaching. No funny business around the edges. They had to be Catholic. In other words, they had to be accepted by all of the churches. There were some books and letters that were read in some churches and not in others. And that was because some churches didn't think this one was right or that one was right. But they had to be accepted by all the churches. And the last one, they had to be liturgical, which means they were all actually read in the church during Mass, during the liturgy. They were read in that circumstance. If you met all four of those criteria, that's how the 27 books got in the New Testament. That, that's all a tradition. <clears throat> How are we doing on time, Patty? Oh, she left. Okay. Okay. All right. So, what are some other important traditions that we have? Well, I can think of a big one. We got this beautiful scripture, and we're all going to read it. And we're all going to agree on everything that it says. Right? No, that's not. <laughs> we got a lot of evidence around us that that's not really possible. Um, we need someone to interpret, especially the confusing things. We need some place to go to get some guidance on what these things mean and how we should apply them to our lives. That's the church. Um, let's see, I wanted to say. Oh, this is a big word for you. Perspicuous. 
That's the big fancy word that the Protestants used when they said the Bible alone. Luther said every plowboy can read the scripture and see the, the clear meaning. That means that the Bible is perspicuous. The word perspicuous means it's obvious what it means. It's clear to everybody what it means. I would argue otherwise. I think we have a lot of Protestant denominations, the number is ever increasing that shows that we've got people who don't agree on what the Bible says. So you need an authority to help you know what the scriptures mean. Now I'm not saying the church has written a book someplace that tells, goes through every single verse in the scripture and tells you that it means this one thing and it doesn't mean anything else. No. There's lots of parts of scripture that the church doesn't comment on. Sometimes it's because it's pretty evident what those things mean. Other times it means, hey, this can mean more than one thing. When you read scripture, the, the way the catechism puts it, you need to read it through the mind of the church. And how does the church tell us to read scripture? Well, there are two different senses of scripture. There's the literal sense and there's the spiritual sense. And the literal, the literal sense might not be what you think it means. <clears throat> Every single word in the scripture is concretely and absolutely true, like historically, scientifically accurate. No, that's not literal, that's literalistic. Literal meaning takes into account what type of literature is this? The Bible is not a book. The Bible is a library of books and letters from all different literary genres. You have historical books, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles. You've got historical books. You also have poetry, like the Song of Solomon. <clears throat> Would you want to take that book literally? Your eyes are doves. She's got two birds crammed in her eye socket. No, no, that's a poem. It's a love poem. You've got books that are just Proverbs. Just endlessly. Proverbs, Proverbs, Proverbs. You've got music. You've got 150 songs in the middle of, of the scripture that are meant to be sung. So, you want to take into account what type of literature you're looking at. You want to know who the author is. It was a human being inspired by God, but it was a human being. So you want to know what kind of environment he was living in. <clears throat> you want to know who his audience was. Who was he writing that for? And what kind of difficulty were they having? Example, the letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament. Well, it's to the Hebrews, so he's... I think it's Paul. People argue about who the author is. I think it's Paul. St. Paul is writing to a group of Jewish Christians. They've converted, but they are battling. Paul, is, Paul spends almost all of his time, minus dealing with the Corinthians, he spends almost all of his time battling the first great heresy in the church. That's the Judaizer heresy. We talked about that last week, I think. There are these Jews who have become Christian that are going around telling the Gentiles, <clears throat> you have to become Jewish first. We have to circumcise your men. Grown men. <clears throat> we have to circumcise your men, and you have to eat kosher and obey all the Mosaic law. <clears throat> and these Judaizers are pressuring these new Christians who were Jews to do those things. And some of them are even considering coming out of Christianity. That's, that's who the book of Hebrews is written to. They're thinking about going back just to Judaism. They're just going to give up their faith. And Paul is desperately writing to them to tell them, don't do this. The book of Hebrews is kind of hard to read in some places. He says, if you abandon your faith now, it would be, have been better off for you not to have come in the first place. Those are serious words. But that's the dilemma they were, they were living in. So, 
That's to get the literal sense of what you're reading. What about the spiritual sense? Well, there are, the church breaks the spiritual sense down into three parts. There's the moral meaning of the scripture. There's the allegorical meaning. And the anagogical meaning. Okay, big remember, this is an evening of strange words. Strange words. We're going to have lots of strange words. So, moral is pretty easy. A lot of scripture teaches you morals. It teaches you moral lessons. That's a pretty easy one to grab. The allegorical is a little different. The allegorical means that in certain places in scriptures, it will tell a story and there will be people or things or actions in that story that are types. Another, another word for allegorical is typological. They are types of something coming in the future. For example, in the Old Testament, when the Israelites are out in the wilderness and the serpents come and start biting them and they start dying, and they beg Moses to do something, and so God tells Moses, make a, make a, a bronze serpent and stick it up on a pole. And when the people get bitten, if they look at the serpent, they'll be saved. That serpent up on that pole could be a, a type of Christ. He was lifted up, and the people who turned to him are saved. There's a couple of types for baptism in the Old Testament. Even Peter, in one of his epistles, talks about how as the eight were saved in, in the days of Noah, you are now saved through baptism. Because they were saved through water. Or the Israelites going through the Red Sea. They were saved through water. That, that's looked at as a type of baptism. So you can see these, these analogies to things that happen later on. <clears throat> the last one is the anagogical. And that simply means things that point us to the end, to where we're going. Like Jesus tells a lot of parables about where we're going. There's a lot of, there's wedding feasts that people get invited to or not invited to. And if you show up with the wrong clothes on, you get kicked out into the darkness where there's wailing and gnashing of teeth. Or the, or the maidens, I can't remember, there was like 12 wise maidens and 12 not so wise maidens, or is it 12 or 10? Or, I can't remember. Anyway, there's the thing about the, the wise maidens brought extra oil for their lantern while they're waiting on the bridegroom to come. And the unwise maidens didn't bring any extra. So when the bridegroom shows up, the wise maidens light their lamps and go into the wedding feast. The unwise ones don't have any oil for their lantern, so they don't go into the feast. That's a description of going into the, to the marriage feast, the kingdom of heaven. So you get, you get this kind of idea that there are these symbolisms and things in here that you can read in Scripture. And that's a, that's a tradition. There's a, there's a Vatican document, it's free, that talks about <clears throat> this is how the church, it, it goes into a lot more detail than what I went into. It's fairly long, so if you're adventurous and you want to read it, I highly recommend it. It's very good, but it takes, it's a slog. It takes a little while to get into it. Okay, so... What about other sources of biblical interpretation? The church fathers, especially the early patristic church fathers in the second, third, and fourth century. These guys wrote mountains of material. Bible commentaries about every book in the Bible. And they really liked to put long biblical quotations in their commentaries. They just loved to write about the Bible. And so they would put I heard the scripture scholar, I mean the, the New Testament uh, manuscript guy I told you about last week, Daniel Wallace. He says that if you, if you took all of the New Testament manuscripts we've discovered over the centuries, if you took them all away, we didn't have any. He said we could reconstruct the New Testament just by reading the church fathers. They quoted so, such big swaths of the New Testament. He said, you could just take all of that out of there and just reconstruct the New Testament from them. That's a lot of writing. Okay. So, 
I wrote down here, private versus public. This is more about tradition, but we're, gonna, we're starting to get into to revelation. Divine revelation. This is the deposit of faith. This is the thing that the magisterium and the church are entrusted with passing down, right? Well, you've got two types of teaching, two types of revelation. Public revelation is the thing we're talking about now and what we talked about last week. Scripture and the tradition passed down from the apostles. Well, the last apostle died in A.D. 90. That was the close of public revelation. That's over. There can be no more public revelation. There cannot be another book added to Scripture. Now, revelation develops. We understand it better over time. And if you look at church history, we usually get that understanding when there's a dust-up over something, where there's a problem. Like we got the Trinity kind of worked out, that whole dogma, in, in the 4th and the 5th century because we had heretics trying to tell us that Jesus wasn't God. Then they tried to tell us the Holy Spirit wasn't God. And church councils had to get together and hash that out. Now the evidence for those things was in public revelation. You can't do anything outside public revelation that, does, that contradicts public revelation. You can't do that. Public revelation closed at the end of the first century. Private revelation is everything else that people claim is of God. All the prayers and devotions that Catholics do, it's private revelation. So where the rubber meets the road is, what part do I have to believe? You have to believe public revelation. Those are the dogmatic teachings of the church. You do not have to believe any private revelation that you don't find attractive to you. If you just don't accept that, that's... That's a lot of the, like I said, the private devotions. That's the rosary. The rosary is a private revelation. You are not bound by church law to say the rosary. You should because it's beautiful, but you're not required by the church to believe in it. Now, you might want to go and read about another private revelation. Um, <clears throat> the appearance of Our Lady at Fatima, Portugal at the beginning of the 20th century, which was witnessed by like 100,000 people that were there. That's probably the most public private revelation ever with that many people that saw it. It's still a private revelation. There are some private revelations that the church has studied and written that this is acceptable it doesn't contradict anything in public revelation. You're allowed to believe in this. But the church never requires anybody to believe in it. Is that fairly clear, the difference between public and private, I hope? Okay. So, we talked about how Everything passed down from the apostles. So, oh. To, uh, to, uh, so, so, going back going to public, back versus, public versus private. private. So, so, to summarize, summarize might it be safe to say, to say that, that a private, private revelation, revelation simply, simply just can't just reveal anything new, new and, and or contradict what's already, what's already been revealed, revealed through the scriptures and through tradition. Correct. Through sacred tradition. So, correct. that's just like that's the, like the like overall summary of it. No matter how public or private it is. Right. Per se. Okay. A couple of more big words. So Jesus revealed the, the, the entirety of the deposit of faith to the apostles. Some of it they wrote down, some of it they didn't write down yet. And that revelation took place until the last one died. And there are two different kinds of revelation that they got. While Jesus was alive and walking, he spoke verbally to them and told them 
in person. The church even has a name for that. That's dominical revelation. Dominical meaning dominus, the word for Lord in Latin. That was the Lord himself telling them that. Now Jesus rises and ascends, and who comes next? The Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit <clears throat> revealed the rest of the divine revelation. And that's the fancy church word for that is the divino apostolic revelation. That came from the Holy Spirit. And of course, all that ends when the last apostle dies. More strange words, I know. So, about the magisterium. That's a confusing thing for some people because a lot of words get thrown around attached to that, the, the Attached to the base word magisterium, you'll hear things like ordinary magisterium, extraordinary magisterium, living magisterium, authentic magisterium, ordinary and universal magisterium. This is confusing. I'm confusing myself just saying the words right now. What it means is, is an old, old use of the word ordinary. Ordinary just means the way we usually do things. We have the ordinary magisterium, which means this is the ordinary, the usual way the church teaches things. That's Father doing a homily in the Mass. You can, make the, you can make the argument that what I'm doing right now is part of the ordinary teaching magisterium of the church. Because Father Juan said I could do this talk. So it's under his authority, not my authority. The, the ordinary magisterium is not infallible. Father can make a mistake in his homily. I could certainly make a mistake standing up here talking to y'all. I am not infallible. So the ordinary magisterium is not infallible. So if ordinary is the, the way we usually do things, what's the extraordinary? We don't usually do things this way. An example of the extraordinary magisterium is an, an ecumenical council. Vatican I and Vatican II. We don't have councils all the time. Before Vatican I, there were several centuries we didn't have a council. That's kind of extraordinary to have a council like that. But councils can teach infallible things. Not all of them did, but if they made dogmatic declarations in their, in their writings, in their documents, and they're real clear about that, that we dogmatically define and hold that all Catholics must believe this with religious, with divine and religious faith. So an ecumenical council can give you something that's in, infallible, but if they don't declare that, then it's possible they could make a mistake. The ordinary and universal magisterium, that part is infallible. Well, all I did was add a word. I said the ordinary magisterium is not infallible, but the ordinary universe and universal magisterium is infallible. It's that tricky word, universal. It's the divine revelation taught throughout the centuries and agreed upon by all the teaching magisterium for all time that the church has existed. So, just because somebody died doesn't mean you can change what they taught. All the apostles died. You can't come along in the second century and start changing stuff, even if you're the Pope. The deposit of faith is sealed. It can't be changed. So, universal basically lets in all the dead people. G.K. Chesterton, Chesterton had this great phrase. He called it, the democracy of the dead they still get a vote. You can't veto their vote. Does that all kind of make sense? Maybe? A little bit? I know, big words, weird stuff. 
So, what time is it, Patty? Oh, wow. So, Chuck, I have a question for you. This is, a, this is a legitimate one, not, not one to just spark conversation. Oh, this isn't a setup. Okay. This right. isn't a setup. So, where would something like discipline and canon law, just to throw in some other words for everyone to learn about, uh, fit under ordinary magisterium versus ordinary universal magisterium? Okay. Um. Well, let me do this. Let me talk about there's, there's different teaching levels if you, take, if you take the magisterium as a whole. There are different levels of authority that different teachings have. If, it's, if it comes from divine revelation, that means scripture and tradition before A.D. 90, those are the dogmas of the church. They have to be believed to be Catholic. That's all the articles in the... I'm going to give you some examples. All the articles in the creed the Christological dogmas, the Marian dogmas, Christ's institution of the sacraments and their efficacy to impart grace, the real presence in the Eucharist, the fa- sacrificial nature of the Mass. The, these are dogmas. They are, there's, there's no wiggle room on these because they were divinely revealed by either Christ himself or the Holy Spirit. Okay. Then there's a second level of magisterial teaching which you are not bound to the way the first level is. The first level, there's no choice. The second level of teachings are things that may not be directly revealed in in divine revelation, but they're attached to things. They're They're the logical progression of things that are divine revelation. And these are things like the legitimate election of a pope, the celebration of ecumenical councils, calling an ecumenical council, that's part of this, the canonization of saints, the moral teachings on things, illicit things like prostitution and fornication and murder, things like that. Um, The male-only priesthood is in that. John Paul II made that pretty clear. And there's a third level that carries even a lower bar of authority. And that's anything outside of the top two that's about faith and morals that the church teaches. And that third level doesn't carry infallibility with it. So you have some... What it says is you're supposed to really look at this with with faith and try to discern what the church is trying to say. And if you really can't wrap your head around it, you should probably try to get a spiritual director and work on it. But you, you're not bound by the same authority as you are to the, either the second level or that top level where all the dogmas are. Now, you asked me about canon law. And canon law is... That's probably in the extraordinary magisterium because we don't come out with a book of canon law every other year. It happened once in 1980-something. It happened back at the first of the 20th century. So I think you are bound with either the, t- the top level or the second level. What do you think? So canon law uh, imposes its juridical authority over the faithful and it's almost like breaking, breaking the speeding law, you know, to, to you know, offer an example. So it's not just that you've broken the letter of the law. Like, it's not um, that there's anything wrong with, with going, intrinsically wrong with going over, say, 35 miles an hour. It's because the authorities that be have said this is the, this is the lines that we're going to stay in. So if you jump outside of those lines, you're subverting our authority as the state. So right. That's kind of my understanding of how canon law is, because it can change. So, within reason, like I know most of canon law has to do with how mass is celebrated, but then there's certain things like how weddings are to be conducted, and uh, the church does have some authority to say that we can change this aspect of it. 
Now, that, that would fall under like ecclesiastical revelation. That's things that the church put in place as the centuries have rolled by. Because times change and fights change and people get into other kinds of problems. And like, like we've had technological things going on with us the past couple of hundred years that the people in the Middle Ages didn't, they didn't have these problems to deal with. They didn't have Facebook and Twitter and all this other stuff. So they didn't, they didn't need a lot of the rules that the church has to come up with to deal with these new technological things. So that's probably a ecclesiastical revelation is where that would probably fall in. What was the other thing you asked, canon law and something else? Uh, discipline. Uh, discipline, that one, that one was, was more, more of a setup. setup. So where does so discipline, discipline, so like uh, uh, priestly celibacy, celibacy would right. be a discipline, discipline of the church, but not right. necessarily a dogma, right. because, because the, the, a lot of the apostles had, had, had wives. A, di a discipline, the church can change a discipline. You can't change a dogma. So let me so ask let me you ask this. this, thinking about thinking marriage about specifically, specifically um, so, so like, like Whenever the church says you must get married inside the walls of the Catholic Church if you're both Catholic, that is, would that be more of like a discipline that the church has enacted, or would that be more something like, uh, like, just, like what canon law? And it's in canon law, and so is. If it's in canon law, it's ecclesiastical law, so it's church law. Now you can get a dispensation from the bishop. Right, 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 exactly. So that's so, that's, so that would be so that the, would church be the church exercising, exercising its authority, its juridical authority, so to speak. Right. So that's ecclesiastical revelation, I guess you'd call it. So, so I guess something I guess like, like discipline, discipline would fall under ecclesiastical. Ecclesiastical law. Yeah, I think that would probably be right. Patty, I think I used up all my time. <laughs> Well, does anybody, we're going to break into our groups tonight. Um, now, here's what happens normally when we're going to do groups. The speaker, if he's worth a dang, will have thought up three discussion questions for you guys to talk about at your table. Your speaker tonight didn't come up with any. <laughs> I apologize. Now, so I'm going to ask y'all... First, you've got to kind of get acquainted. There may be people at your table that you don't know. Y'all introduce yourselves, visit a little bit. If you want to talk about how you wound up here, those stories are always interesting. But when you get kind of, you know, through introducing each other, think up your own question to talk about, about tradition, about how difficult this is to accept. I mean, I'm, the person talking to you right now I, I was a Southern Baptist nine years ago when I was sitting in your chair. So I come from low church Protestantism, which is very suspicious of authority in churches. We don't like our pastor. He's gone. We fire him. <laughs> Can't fire the Pope. So this authority thing, I had to wrestle with this. This is, this is if you're wrestling with it, I, brother, I feel you. Sister, I feel you. So... So talk about if there's struggles with sort of accepting the... Because tradition itself, like I said, is just knowledge passed down. It's the vehicle that's passing it down that claims to have the authority to take care of it and to pass it down. It's the authority that may challenge people. So talk about that. Talk amongst yourselves about that. 